All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Virtual Science Cafe, brought to you by the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for joining me here at the cafe. Glad you could hang out with us. Hope that you've got a snack, maybe a drink, ready to go. You're relaxed. You've got a great spot on the couch. Maybe you're one of these folks. You've got the YouTube video and you, you do that thing where you cast it up onto your smart TV so you can sit back and, and take in the whole presentation, the whole program, because we've got a great show. I think you're going to learn a lot tonight. You're going to hear some cool stories and learn something new. That's what we really like to do as part of the Virtual Science Cafe. And of course, don't forget, we're here every Thursday night, 7 o'clock at the museum's YouTube channel right here. So you can subscribe to the museum YouTube, click the bell to get notified, and then you can come and join us every Thursday night because we bring you all kinds of great topics across the spectrum of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and more great shows every single week. So do that, right? Remind yourself that this is where you want to be Thursday, seven o'clock. My name is Chris Smith. I am your host every week. So I'm glad you're here with me. Now, let me bring on tonight's very special guest. Tonight's guest didn't have to travel very far. Well, you know what? I used to say that when a guest from North Carolina State University would join us in person at the museum for our events because they're right next door to each other. But now that we're doing things virtually, I shouldn't say that anymore. I didn't have to travel at all because we're right here on the internet. Steve Briggs is the launch director, which is a great job title, by the way, launch director for the North Carolina Plant Sciences Initiative. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris. Glad to be here. So glad you could be with us. How are things on uh, your side of Raleigh tonight? There, uh, It was a beautiful North Carolina fall day. It was just great. So everything's good here. It definitely was. I, I got lucky. I got out of the home office and into, you know, a little bit of green space outside to enjoy it. So that was really nice. I got out and enjoyed some plants. There you go. Which, which maybe was good preparation for tonight's talk. Absolutely. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to you and everybody get ready to learn. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and everyone, good evening. Um, my pleasure to, uh, to be here this evening. Um, hopefully you can see my screen now. I uh, am uh, honored to, to be with all of you tonight. I, I hope uh, at the end of my little presentation here that you've learned something that's going on, as Chris said, right next door to many of us and uh, something that's very exciting. I'm, uh, I'm so fortunate to, to be the launch director, a unique title, but essentially it's, uh, it's director number one and taking hold of the reins of this great initiative that's happening right here in Raleigh. So, uh, so thank you for joining us. Let me start off if I can, uh, uh, talking about uh, agriculture. I've been involved with agriculture essentially my entire career after graduate school. And if I can, I would like to use a, a, an example, an apple example. Now, if I was in front of you, which I wished I was, I wish I was giving this presentation live to you, I would kind of demonstrate this. So you're gonna to have to use your imagination, but uh, bear with me if you could. Let's say this apple represents mother earth in its entirety. It's round, uh, kind of oval. It's a great North Carolina apple here. Take your knife and cut this apple into fours and then throw three quarters of the apple away. The three quarters that you've just discarded essentially uh, Talk, uh, would represent the water and the oceans that this earth has. You can't grow plants in the ocean, hard to grow plants, uh, edible plants in water. So essentially you're down to a quarter of this apple. Now, if you were to take that apple quarter and cut it in half and throw half of that away, essentially you're saying you cannot grow plants in the polar ice caps or the desert regions of the earth. So now you're down to an eighth of an apple. Now, with a sharp knife, you would take that eighth of an apple and cut it into force and throw three of those force away. So essentially, now you have a sliver of the apple that represents one thirty-second of where we started. 
Now with your paring knife, you kind of carefully peel off that skin. This 1 32nd of the entire apple we started with, and now just the skin layer would represent the uh, arable land that we can grow plants on. And in fact, the skin represents the soil and we know soil is so precious to us in the plant environment. And uh, just a, a little a bit of fact, it takes about 400 years to put an inch of soil uh, onto, uh, onto that. So uh, all of the soil in this 1 32nd of an apple is where we have to, as a society, raise and grow our food to serve our population. So with that little introduction, I would like to, uh, to ask uh, Chris or Brent if they could show the, the little one minute video we produced on the Plant Sciences Initiative. One second. By the year 2050, the world will have over 2 billion additional mouths to feed. We must produce more food in the next 31 growing seasons than we have in the past 8,000 years, using less water and natural resources on less farmland in the midst of climate and environmental uncertainty. Solving this humanitarian crisis calls for accelerated innovation in the agricultural and plant sciences. The North Carolina Plant Sciences Initiative is bringing the brightest minds in academia, government, and industry together to drive the plant science discovery and innovation needed to deliver local solutions with global reach. We are recruiting, training, and cultivating interdisciplinary teams equipped to operate nimbly to tackle the agricultural challenges of today and tomorrow. To learn more, visit us online. Very good, thank you. So let's continue. Uh, I think the one minute video that you saw really kind of set up uh, my, uh, my discussion topics for this evening. But uh, again, wanted to uh, take you a little bit deeper in terms of uh, where we're heading here with the North Carolina Plant Science Initiative. We have a bold vision at NC State and with this plant science initiative, and that is to be the premier plant science infrastructure in the world. And uh, this is a little teaser uh, photo here. I will talk about the building that we're constructing on Centennial Campus a little bit later, but let me start with some of the critical aspects of our plant sciences initiative. As a video portrayed, uh, one of the grand challenges we have in society today is how in a, a short 30, 30 years are we gonna feed a bunch more people going from roughly 6 billion people to nine or 10 billion people. We also know that uh, we're gonna have less natural resource to do it with, whether it's less water, less arable land, and we're also faced with a changing climate environment. We also know the world's population is going to change a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit more about what they're eating and how they're eating it. And so we know we're going to need more uh, protein, animal protein in people's diets from a global perspective. We know uh, we'll need more grains from a global perspective, as well as root crops and other edible crops. So these are the challenges that we have as scientists and uh, as an agricultural community in terms of meeting the grand challenge of feeding a bunch more people in 30 short years. The Plant Science Initiative was launched uh, in, in, uh, with two main focuses. One is our local impact, and I'll talk about the local impact importance of our Plant Science Initiative here locally, but it does support our diverse agricultural system in North Carolina. Those of you who live in North Carolina probably know, but uh, I will remind you that uh, we are a very diverse agricultural production state. We grow upwards of almost 90 different commercial crops, meaning crops that farmers grow 
that are taken to the market for, for money or either locally here or exported. This diversity adds to our uh, complexity, but also adds to the dynamic aspect of agriculture here in North Carolina. We do know through a, uh, a market research study that uh, if the initiative, when the initiative gets up and running, uh, it will lead to approximately a $10 billion boost to our ag economy here in North Carolina. Our rural economies, our communities are, are really important to us in agriculture. Right? And we wanna make sure that this initiative is supporting the rural efforts in agriculture. And then you'll hear me say a number of different times in my, car, uh, uh, my talk this evening, how important partners are and will be for the success of the initiative. But as you also know, uh, we wanna reach globally, not only locally. And we do know that uh, uh, this, this, some of the statistics are that 84% of the agricultural jobs are projected to have a plant science kind of aspect to them. We do know that uh, uh, people uh, are angry uh, when they're hungry worldwide and angry people are not happy people. So uh, global food security is out absolutely uh, very big. We also know as the video shows, we need to grow a, a bunch more food that we in, in 2050 than we are growing today. And uh, we also know that uh, this initiative will support business development and partnerships uh, around the state and around the world. Let me take you on a little journey to tell you kind of where we started and kind of where we're heading. Uh, our Dean at the College of Agriculture and Life Science at NC State University, Dean Richard Linton, uh, joined NC State back in late 2012, 2013. And one of the first things he did as Dean was to uh, get his troops together, get his team together and develop a strategic plan. Where were we at the college at the time, 2013? And where do we wanna be in five, six, seven years from now? And so the plan laid out and was the, uh, was the groundwork for this plant sciences initiative. With that plan, he went to the administration of NC State and got their support verbally and also financially. But then very quickly, we launched an economic feasibility study. Takanami Partners out of Ohio did this. And uh, I wanna highlight one of the paragraphs in their uh, uh, feasibility study. The bold words say, uh, but in no location so far has Battelle seen such a, a promising convergence of assets poised to take advantage of large scale expanding markets as North Carolina has in its plant science and associated agrobioscience. So this is a very important milestone to have an independent uh, consultant uh, company with a worldwide uh, reputation to kind of signal to the powers to be not only on our campus but around the state but you know what, we have what it takes to be the best. So with that economic study, um, we, we decided uh, there's a number of things that need to take place to be the best in the world in plant sciences. And one is we do need a new facility, a new plant science research building to conduct the research and, and do some amazing things with plants. And so we launched uh, an effort to, to raise some money and get the money going to uh, fund a plant science building on NC State's campus. And there were several uh, great milestones along the way. In 2016, the great taxpayers of North Carolina approved the NC Connect bond. And in that bond was $85 million towards this plant science building at NC State University. So thank you taxpayers of North Carolina. With that, uh, in simultaneous efforts, we went to a lot of the commodity associations around our state. As I mentioned, we grow upwards of 90 different commercial crops. A lot of these commercial crops form their own associations. So therefore you would have the North Carolina Corn Growers Association. You'd have the Strawberry Growers Association. You have the Sweet Potato Commission. Uh, so you have all of these commodity associations. And when we went to those associations and, and told them about the Plant Science Initiative, they, they saw the benefits and uh, 45 of those uh, associations and associated companies provided an additional $9 million of support going towards the building that we're, uh, that we're building. And I'll talk about it a little bit later. The last big coup uh, was the Golden Leaf Foundation. Uh, they uh, provided a $45 million grant towards the building. The Golden Leaf Foundation, uh, for those of you who are 
uh, not know about them, uh, was a, an association, excuse me, a foundation that was established about 20, 21 years ago from the tobacco settlement money. And there was some great wisdom 20 years ago to stick this money into a foundation that provide ongoing support again, to develop and uh, funnel back into our rural communities as crops were switching away from tobacco into other crops. And this foundation provides grants uh, annually, uh, almost all the time, uh, but we're fortunate to, to have grabbed that uh, and uh, again, to contribute it to our, our building efforts. So this is kind of the, a short journey, starting with a vision of the Dean saying, you know what, we can be the best. Let's put a plan around that Let's get support both uh, academically and from our partners locally and around the state. And then let's start raising money for a brand new building on, on our Centennial campus. Our vision is to be the best. We want to be the best in the country. And we will do that by uh, several things. Uh, one is fostering interdisciplinary research. Back when I was in graduate school and back in the old days, I like to say and tell my kids and grandkids, uh, when I went to graduate school, uh, I, I went to graduate school to be an entomologist. And you know what, I, I got a degree in entomology and I think I was probably pretty good, but I was never really asked to join partnerships with anybody else on campus. I kind of stayed in my office, stayed in the lab, did my field research all on entomology. We do know as a society that we get better answers when we work together from outside, bringing multiple uh, disciplines together, uh, multiple backgrounds together, and kind of forming these interdisciplinary teams that will solve problems together. We wanna create unique partnerships, not only on our campus amongst our, our different colleges. We, NC State is a university made up of colleges. And so we'd like to foster uh, colleges working together on, on problems. But we also want to incorporate the, incorporate the great minds of uh, our ag tech professionals, our industry colleagues, as well as our government scientists. We're going to maximize our efforts for the land grant mission that NC State is, uh, is, is doing. That is our research, teaching, and outreach or extension programs is the mission of a land grant university. And we want to serve those core missions. This initiative will allow us to have com unique competitive advantages as, uh, as we do plant science and, and fight and, and claw for grants and money and support. We wanna be the best so that they look to NC State to, uh, to provide us with grant dollars to grow our program. And again, we wanna be and we'll be known as the premier destination for plant sciences in the world. So the question is why here in North Carolina? Why couldn't it be somewhere else? Well, let me tell you about the great assets we have and why the taconomy study, as well as the rest of us think this is the place for the plant sciences initiative. Number one, as I mentioned, agribusiness is North Carolina's largest industry with over $91 billion in revenue in 19, heading to a cool 100 billion here soon. We do know through some research that every dollar spent in ag research in North Carolina returns almost $20 in economic benefits to our state. So we have this going for us in the state. To be the one number one business in our state uh, gets a lot of positive attention from our government officials that uh, are, pay attention to what's going on and able to give us support. We also have some unique partnerships in our state that uh, I think some of the people that have been here forever uh, to kind of take for granted. And that is a unique partnership between NC State University, uh, our North Carolina Department of Ag and Consumer Services and also the North Carolina Farm Bureau. This triad of people and folks and entities have come together and really working hard to support this initiative. And there's not a day that goes by that I'm not thankful for the partnership of the Farm Bureau and also from the Department of Ag in terms of our efforts to move the ball forward to be the best in the world. I mentioned the 45 commodity groups and other four organizations that came together and actually wrote a check to build a building on our campus. Some checks were smaller than the others, depending on the size of your association. But I'm excited to see the diversity of associations step to the plate, write us a check, and provide some early funding for the initiative. I'll also point out that not all of these associations are plant kind of based. You see the pork producers on here. You see the Beef Cattlemen's, uh, Beef Cattlemen's Association. You see the Dairy Foundation. 
Obviously these critters, these animals eat plant-based products, but they also know the value of a strong plant science initiative here in North Carolina. As I mentioned, we're extremely grateful for the Golden Leaf Foundation's uh, uh, support of the building. Uh, they uh, uh, again gave us the largest individual check, I think in their history, 20 year history. And uh, we are shepherding that money carefully as we build uh, a great building on our campus. You can't have a great initiative without great people. And I will start by saying we have got great partners, great intellectual horsepower uh, right next door to where we are located here at NC State. We have large international ag tech companies such as BASF and Syngenta and Novozymes. We have smaller companies, whether they're startups or smaller companies that have a, a global reach as well. And I will say that we're fortunate to, to be able to tap into many of these organizations and really incorporate them onto some of our science teams. Our faculty members have some of the scientists from industry working on their teams on grand challenge projects. And we're excited about that. And then we're also uh, fortunate to have the brain power from two other uh, uh, universities that are very close by, uh, UNC Chapel Hill and Duke. Although not focusing on plant sciences per, uh, per se, they do have some great biologists and great plant people that, uh, again, we're using their knowledge and their intellect. And a lot of these uh, faculty members and people associated with Duke and UNC have been part and are part of some of our committees that we're using to, to drive our efforts forward in the plant sciences initiative. Last but not least, uh, our state geography is very unique. As all of you know, who have been here any length of time, our state is, is, is long and narrow. Uh, and, and in that geography of our state, we have over 400 different soil types. What's important to, to realize in our state is that we have, and I'll drop down to that third point there, we have 25 research stations spread out from west to east in our state. 18 of these are in partnership with the NCDA, Department of Ag, and seven are NC State operated. But these 25 research stations from west to east really can tap into the different climate zones, the different soil types, the different rainfall regimes, the different temperatures that uh, crops can grow in. And in fact, we can mimic in our state here alone, we can mimic many of the growing regions around the world. So if you're a company or a faculty member doing research and you want your product to be global product, whether it's a new plant hybrid, new cultivar, uh, a new uh, product used in crops, you can go to Southeast North Carolina and get going early in the season and take that product and test it out in the mountains where the seed is a little bit behind because of the temperatures. So this unique partnership and unique uh, 25 research locations in our state give us some great diversity in terms of field research. So a faculty member or a researcher can take an idea from his or her head, take it into the laboratory, prove the concept there, take it into the greenhouse, prove the concept there, and then through our network of research stations, take this product and test it from west to east to see if it's commercially viable. I will tell you firsthand, we've had a lot of companies relocate to North Carolina in the RTP region, just based on our field network of stations, knowing that they don't have to hop on an airplane, they can get in an automobile, and from RTP, pretty be, be pretty much anywhere in four and a half, five hours to any of these research stations. This is a huge advantage for us in North Carolina. We're also blessed from, uh, to have a great cooperative extension network. Each of our counties in North Carolina has a county extension office manned with professional men and women that uh, are able to give great advice, agricultural advice, 4-H advice, consumer advice, but we really have a lot of professionals spread from east to west in each of our county offices. All of these county offices are tied into our special on our NC State campus and also from nc &T in Greensboro and are able to get up-to-date latest results, research results to take to their local farmers. County extension is, uh, is one, again, our citizens should not take advantage, uh, to, to, uh, should take advantage of because it's unique. We are one of the last two or three strongholds for a strong cooperative extension network in our entire country. 
a lot of states have abandoned the extension networks and really have uh, relegated it to minor use. I'm excited about the leadership in our extension network and also the leadership in our counties from there that. And then last but not least, here comes that word again, that's partnerships. Uh, we will not be successful if we think we can uh, uh, get our heads in the sand and work only and on our campus without involving industry professionals from state and local and some of our value professionals in, our, in the RTP area. So that's kind of a unique perspective from a North Carolina geographic perspective and kind of what we have going in, uh, in our state. I will also say this project will not be successful if we don't have great talent, great people, great scientists trying to figure out answers to those grand challenges of how do we feed a bunch more people in 30 years than we have today. I'm excited about what NC State has stepped up to do. In fact, in the last four years, uh, over 100 faculty members have been hired to look at some aspect of plant science hundred new faculty in the last four years. Just to give you a perspective, our college, and not all of these hundred faculty are in our college, but our college only has 300, 320 faculty member total. So to turn over about a third of your faculty members to you, new young energy, exciting scientists coming from diverse backgrounds, working together is just absolutely turned our campus on, on its end uh, as we have this uh, excitement about uh, doing things differently, doing things collaboratively, working with others to solve the problems. This is a huge investment. It takes uh, quite a bit of money and commitment to hire over 100 faculty. Uh, the $12 million would represent kind of the yearly uh, ongoing salaries and, and things that we have to pay these faculty. And then all these faculty kind of come in and are awarded uh, uh, what we call startup packages to, to buy, purchase uh, special equipment that they need to run the research. So a huge financial commitment. And uh, I'm telling you what, uh, back when we were all together on campus, uh, this was probably the most exciting thing about my job is interacting with these faculty members who have just some great ideas, willing to roll up their sleeves and work together to, to get things done. Just a, a very satisfying part of, of my job. Again, when I went to school, uh, I was an entomologist and that was kind of my title. Uh, I, I think uh, titles, uh, you know, you can go to school and be a plant pathologist. You can go to school and be an agronomist. But look at some of the job descriptions here from some of these new 100 faculty members. They're not just specialists in their own field. We're talking about uh, people, computer people working with bioinformatics, how to manage the data, how to do data digital transformation, how to uh, t uh, tell our story to the, to the society and to the public. How do we communicate our issues through public policy and communication? How do plants play into our food security? How do we produce plants that are uh, more nutritious and maybe take less water and less fertilizer to grow? All of these job descriptions are some of the new faculty are, are fulfilling uh, today when we get them on board. So we kind of think of uh, what we have going here with the initiative as kind of a pipeline. We will take things from the basic lab from a discovery standpoint, kind of fine tune it, keep tweaking it, develop an application to figure out how to deliver it to the field, and then obviously help our growers locally and internationally uh, implement that to uh, be successful in their own location. Uh, this discovery to implementation pipeline is unique with NC State. There are other plant science institutions around the world uh, doing great things, but I will tell you that they sometimes focus on one chink in this pipeline. They're either great lab discovery people or they're great implementers, uh, but we have the, uh, the know-how and the breadth of talent and faculty the expertise to drive this entire pipeline. The other thing that I want to touch on here in a couple of slides, uh, and I'll start here, is the uh, probably the best thing that will come out of NC State is the talent or the student training that we're providing in terms of uh, making sure that we have students that are trained and developed to hit the world uh, with their feet on the ground and running hard. 
uh, we want to make sure our students are, are, uh, are trained in this, uh, in this new way of understanding how education needs to be taught and delivered. So just a summary, kind of uh, our core goals here. Uh, again, using interdisciplinary teams, we want to use those teams to really tackle some of these complex global challenges. And these are tough challenges. How can you produce 50, 60% more food than we're producing today in 30 short years with less resources? How can we use our partners to help meet our farmer and industry needs? Our partners are brilliant and we wanna make sure we're using their expertise. How can we build our first class facility on Centennial Campus to recruit and retain the best people in the world? It takes great minds, whether they're faculty minds, uh, graduate student minds, staff minds, to be the best. And we realized early on that without a new building, uh, it was gonna be hard to do, but we're excited to talk about this new building here in just a minute. This economic driver that the initiative will, will supply will grow our state, will grow jobs in our state, will grow our rural economies and create jobs, which uh, are, are, are number one. And then last but not least, I talked about this next generation student able to meet the society's questions and demands for uh, what we're asking our graduates to be. So we'll develop and deliver innovative technologies, new crop varieties or cultivars that are maybe high value, which are cherished in our state because we have a lot of commodity crops or, or excuse me, uh, non-commodity crops. We have specialty crops such as strawberries and blueberries and sweet potatoes and sweet corn. Uh, all of these crops are really high value acre crops. We hope to use the science coming out to, to develop new food products. Uh, we have uh, some amazing faculty looking at the new, new things with uh, maybe some old, old tricks. Uh, we hope to attract industry capital so we can get these projects keep going, create jobs and then train uh, that new workforce. Let me talk about our students uh, because that is one of the missions of our land grant university is teaching. And I will tell you, if for those of you at home who have uh, kids at home, and maybe some of those kids are trying to figure out what career they want to do when they graduate from college, I will tell you there is a job ready for them uh, in agriculture. Now, agriculture, I think, is if you talk to people who are not from the farm, they think agriculture is a, uh, a person kind of a maybe my age uh, riding on a tractor. Well, that could be. But I will tell you the breadth of agricultural jobs is absolutely tremendous, all the way from computers, digital applications, to robotics, to plant genetics, to agronomists, to soil scientists, to chemists, to uh, public policy people, to regulatory people. This agricultural field is absolutely huge. And what the uh, USDA forecast uh, that uh, we will need almost 58,000 people every year coming into agriculture to meet the demand. And our land grant university, our ag colleges around the country are only producing a little over 35,000. So we're still, you see, we're only supplying about 61% of the available jobs for people who want a job in agriculture, love to be in agriculture and wanna stay in agriculture. So my word to uh, all of you with uh, kids that are trying to figure out what to do, look at the College of Ag and Life Sciences here at NC State look at another ag college from outside of our state and look at kind of what careers and opportunities and curriculum uh, meets, their, uh, meets their needs. I guarantee you uh, they can find something that will excite them. So this workforce uh, of tomorrow, our students, uh, as I mentioned, uh, when I graduated from graduate school, uh, I, I was pretty good entomologist, but I really wasn't forced to be in to know anything about uh, e uh, economics, farm economics. I wasn't really forced to understand how uh, public policy is made with regards to agriculture. I wasn't really forced to learn how to be uh, work in, in the regulatory field of agriculture. Our students coming out of NC State on the Plant Science Initiative will have a broad, wide base of training. They will continue to be strong in their discipline. So if you're an entomologist, at NC State, you're gonna be a great entomologist, but you know what? You're gonna be able to uh, understand the economics. You're gonna be able to do public speaking. You're gonna be able to, uh, to uh, be a leader in a team setting. And uh, all of these uh, opportunities are gonna be provided uh, at NC State. 
We also uh, will expect our graduates uh, to have a, a kind of an internship, whether it's a local internship with a government or state agency, whether it's an internship with one of the companies in RTP, uh, maybe foreign or local. Uh, but the, we do know that students uh, with some kind of internship uh, are again, a, a better student for tomorrow. As I mentioned, we expect our students to have what they call these soft skills, which uh, is kind of a oxymoron because some of these soft skills such as public speaking, leadership skills are really, really tough, but we're gonna kind of instill and do some training to make sure our students are, are better than they have been in the past. Our society is also asking us about food, how we're producing our food today. Are we doing it sustainably? Are we doing it the right way? Are we doing it with the latest scientific information that we have? And we need to be stand up for agriculture and let people know that the what, what and how we're growing our crops and how we're growing our plants is the best way in the world to grow that. So we need to be transparent. We need to have that public speaking uh, sound bites in our pocket and understand the, uh, the appreciation that uh, society has uh, for agriculture. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Let me give you an example of something that's uh, just kind of bring it home to you in terms of maybe one research project that uh, we're working on at NC State under the Plant Sciences Initiative. And that is uh, this plant sensor project. Again, let me use your imagination. Uh, all of us in our homes uh, have smoke detectors. Some of us have carbon dioxide detectors. And what these detectors allow us to, to use them for is that if you have a smoldering ember in your attic or you have a, a, an appliance or something that's leaking CO2, these sensors will send an audible alarm to you, to me, saying, you know what? This house isn't uh, safe. You probably need to get out or you need to investigate what's going on here. Now we'll put that into agricultural sense in terms of sensor technologies. We're, we can now develop sensors that allow plants to, uh, to signal to us about what's going on in their world. So essentially <coughs> we can put a, a monitor uh, on a plant and understand the plant talk that's going on. And plants do talk, they talk to each other and they talk through each other by emitting volatile organic compounds, VOCs. And the VOCs are very unique to what is happening to that plant. So for instance, I'm a corn plant, I'm sitting in the field and I have an insect chewing on one of my leaves. The plant will send out a volatile organic compound into the air, signaling that it's under attack from this case, an insect but it may be a disease. It may be a drought situation. It may be a flood situation. It, and different VOCs are sent out into the air, uh, essentially by these plants signaling, you know what, I'm not healthy. I'm not right. What if we can capture the individual VOC compounds that are being emitted by these plants, even before we see the plant under stress, even before anybody knows there's an issue, what if we can detect, uh, detect problems here to these plants really early and, uh, and handle those uh, before a problem gets widespread in the field? <coughs> That's just one example of, uh, of uh, am I still talking? Yeah. That's just one example of a, a project that's uh, really neat. And it incorporates plant pathologists, it incorporates engineers working together on a big problem here. And I'm really excited about this project. Let's talk about the building for a minute. Uh, a lot of people like to talk about the building because it's big, it's fancy, it's sexy, it's uh, gonna be tremendous. But uh, let's, let's talk about that. First of all, the building is being built on our Centennial campus. All of you, or so most of you probably have been to our Centennial campus. The most iconic building on our Centennial campus today is the Hunt Library. And you see that kind of there in the center of the screen. This campus is unique for UNC State in that it has a lot of private public partnerships. In fact, we have over 70 different private companies working alongside our faculty on projects for these companies and for our faculty. 
and we want to uh, join this neighborhood of partnerships with our plant science initiative uh, building that we're building just up the street from this Hunt Library that all of you have been by. Our building. We started thinking about this building when we started raising some money uh, and have had over 120 different faculty and staff involved with our input sessions. So back in about 2015, 2016, we started incorporating and talking to faculty and staff about if you had a brand new building for your research projects, what would it look like in terms of uh, what would it have? This tremendous input has allowed us to shape the architecture of the building and then obviously the, uh, the design and now the construction. The building, and I'll show you here another couple of slides, uh, will have five stories. We do have a rooftop greenhouse on top of the building. So the fifth floor is the greenhouse space. The building uh, will be uh, built to attain, attain at least LEED silver certification. And we're almost right on the verge of, uh, of gaining gold status. Let me pause just for a minute and grab a glass of water. And everybody who's watching, uh, as we're going along and getting uh, close to the Q&A section, you've got the chat box right there, right there on the YouTube. So you can leave your questions, comments, what you're thinking about in the chat box. And once we get to our audience Q&A section, I'll be grabbing those and posing those back to Steve so we can have a little bit of conversation and dialogue about plant sciences and the plant sciences initiative. Thanks, Chris. I should have had water to begin with, but I didn't. Uh, no worries. Yes, now I'm ready to go. Uh, so our building will be uh, environmentally built as, as best we can to attain the lead silver or gold status. This five floor, uh, this five story building, the first floor is our, uh, will be the public floor. This will be the floor that I will invite all of you to tour when the building is open. Uh, because it will be a fantastic floor to give you uh, some educational sound bites and snippets about uh, some of the research that's going on in this building and around our state. Some of you will be invited to different events that we will hold uh, in this building because we do have a 145 or 150 seat auditorium that we can hold uh, lectures and seminars and, uh, and dinners in. Uh, and so we, uh, we will, this, uh, this room will be highly used by the public. We can have outreach events on the lawn. Uh, I'll show you the lawn here in a minute and kind of adjourn inside and have a nice meal. Floors two, three, and four are research floors. Unlike most academic buildings that are built on campuses today, this building has no formal classrooms. The seminar room can be split into three and we can have classes in there, but the, the, the building has no formal classrooms which is kind of unique for a university building. This is a research building designed for team research on plant issues, plant problems, plant, uh, plant projects. Also uniquely in this building, we've carved out two different spaces for external partners to come and have an office or have a desk or have a lab bench in this building. So again, they can rub elbows and work side by side with some of our faculty. We can house about 25 or 26 different interdisciplinary research projects, depending on how different, uh, how big the projects are. Uh, and our building will have in any given day uh, around 300 people doing science in this plant science building. I'll tell you today we're on time and on budget, which is uh, very exciting. Uh, I happened to visit the, through there today and uh, I'll, I'll give you an update on that. When are we gonna be open? With buildings about halfway done, and so we anticipate our faculty will be moving their research projects into this building late fall of 21 or spring of 22. So about uh, 14, 15, 16 months from now. <coughs> Here's a, a rendition of uh, us coming up onto the building. You'll see kind of on the ground floor, obviously we are. On the left-hand side there is kind of a, a look in some of the glass there will be that seminar symposium room uh, behind that hallway there. Our straight ahead 
will be the front door of the building, but you, you notice immediately the unique architecture of the building. A lot of glass, uh, uh, obviously NC State red brick. Uh, we wouldn't be a, a campus building without that. But this is just a tremendous visually appealing building. Another iconic building put on our Centennial campus. Beautiful landscape. You can't have a plant science building without beautiful landscape. We will have the, the latest turf grass varieties. We have little plots growing here to show different maybe research projects that are going on in the building. We've taken them out, putting in some of these plots. And then obviously you'll have opportunity to sit out and converse with your colleagues or, or your friend as you're walking by. The first floor will also kind of have an educational exhibit area uh, kind of in the corner of this building. Our friends at North Carolina Farm Bureau has sponsored this educational commons area. We'll have three uh, screens, touch screens. You can learn a little bit more about plant science uh, in this building and around the state and around the world. We'll talk about the, a little bit of history of North Carolina in terms of agriculture. We'll talk about the leadership of uh, agriculture in our state and around the world. Uh, and so that'll be a part of this first floor. And then as well, we wanna make a tribute to those first 45 folks, associations and companies that stepped forward and wrote us a check for this fantastic building. And we'll have a tribute to those 45 on this first floor. So again, a tremendous building. I can't wait to show it off. You can't wait to get there just to see uh, kind of uh, how beautiful this thing is gonna be. Again, kind of a, another shot. You see the front door there kind of front and center, uh, a two-story uh, hearth or entrance way when you walk in, kind of a grand opening. You notice all the glass here looking out over Centennial Campus. Uh, the, the kind of the highest peaks there towards the front, uh, the top floor, the fourth floor, there is a nice boardroom. We can host some tremendous uh, executives and, and officials in this boardroom that will be uh, uh, world-class in terms of its audio visual capabilities to connect with anybody in the world. Uh, just below that on the third floor, you see another nice meeting room, nice meeting facility on the corner of this building, again, overlooking Centennial Campus and then uh, also downtown Raleigh. You also see a great shot of the greenhouse on the fifth floor in the background here in the evening. This greenhouse is tremendous uh, in terms of what we'll be able to do here. The greenhouse is not just one greenhouse. There's 11 different compartments in this greenhouse setting. Some are smaller than others, uh, but it will allow individual faculty teams to do different research in 11 different so-called compartments. One of these compartments, uh, the greenhouse is set aside to do <clears throat> what I have called some, some really tough work on some tough plant issues, such as uh, viruses and fungi. And uh, to build uh, one of these compartments, uh, you have to have special glass, special fittings, special water filtration, air filtration. People working in this greenhouse will have to put gowns and goggles and mask on to, to work in these facilities. But we've equipped this building to be able to handle some of that, what I call, quote unquote, nasty research with organisms that you just don't uh, need to have out in the, in the world. The rest of the 10 compartments, the other 10 compartments of the greenhouse, just what I'll call normal activity from uh, faculty looking to do their experiments in these greenhouse. The greenhouse will be fairly tall. It's not your typical nine, 10 foot tall greenhouses. This greenhouse glass will uh, rise above the building about 24, 25 foot. So it allows us to go grow full-size crops such as corn uh, and even hops. And we have some faculty member working on hops and hops is, as many of you know, is a very tall growing crop. So just a, again, a tremendous iconic building. I will also tell you this, uh, this building sits on the highest point at Centennial Campus. Um, and so when the greenhouse is lit, like it shows here, yeah, people are gonna see this building from far away just because of the lights in the greenhouse. So let me summarize. Uh, we do have an aspiration for innovative research. That's what it's gonna take to solve the grand challenges. We will provide a competitive edge for our students. Our students uh, are, are, are graduate today with great opportunities. We just think this will make them even more globally competitive as a student and where they wanna take their career, whether it's back to the farm, whether it's continuing on as a faculty member at some university, whether it's an industry research job or industry job uh, or any other uh, associated industries uh, with agriculture. 
And then we also want, because of the great support from our local farmers, uh, the taxpayers of North Carolina, we want to make sure that we're making their life better in the future, whether that's new technology, a better understanding of how to grow crops, maybe some new crops, uh, crops that can grow in uh, maybe some different climate changing conditions. We make that commitment to our farmers to be better at, uh, at farming than they are today. With that, I will close here. Uh, I enjoyed the, the evening visiting with you on this plant science initiative. I uh, am so excited to, to be the launch director, the, uh, the initial director in this. Uh, and uh, because this is uh, not about me, uh, it's about uh, generations to come, my kids, my grandkids that will benefit from this initiative and what comes out of it in the future. So thank you for the opportunity, the invite to present to this uh, team tonight. And I'd be happy to take a few questions that have maybe come in. Chris? All right. Thank you, Steve. Thanks very much. Everybody can drop little clapping hands emojis into the chat box for Steve. Uh, okay. Ex great stuff. I mean, this thing, this is like the Star Trek enterprise of plant sciences. Yeah, it's a... Uh... You know, I, I, I used to come home early on in my job uh, to my wife and, and my mind was just blown by some of the things the faculty are talking about. A lot of it goes right over my head because they're so smart, <laughs> but there's some really neat stuff going on that's going to change this world uh, when they hit. It's just amazing. I mean, yeah, it sounds really cool. And I mean, I couldn't agree more with you that North Carolina is the best place for it to happen. Like North Carolina is a great place to have a big natural history museum. It's a great place to have, uh, you know, this focus for plant sciences and plant research. And it's so much of what we do, so much of the identity of North Carolina, right? Absolutely. And we, I mean, all the assets are here. It's not like we're making them up. They're, they're here. And uh, it's fun to tap in those resources and get the cooperation of a bunch of partners. Yeah, I actually was struck by the uh, the research station network that you mentioned. And spread out all across the state it's easy they're easy to get to that's great for the researchers and for the the partners uh, but just that we have this spider web of I, I assume like are, are they like research labs or places where people can collect data what happens there yeah it's uh if how you go to one of the farms I invite you uh, you know yeah some of the uh, well, we have a farm on Lake Wheeler overlooks downtown Raleigh that's our closest one uh but you'll go there and we have a beef unit, we have a turf grass unit, we have a corn place. So you go and faculty are, are generating data and graduate students are out there working. Uh, but uh, you know, this is replicated essentially you know, 24 times uh, around our state. Uh, and uh, these research stations sometimes have a focus. You'll go to say the Piedmont research stations and they're focused on small grains and poultry production. And then you go to the uh, Eastern shore and they're focused on fish and, and other things. So each of them kind of have their own specialty. And uh, we have faculty that live and work on these stations every day, waking up and collecting data and, and doing great things on these research stations. It's, it is, Chris, very unique from our state to support these in the fashion we do. And, and some of the great inventions uh, that come out of some of these research stations, just tremendous. Excellent stuff. All right, so uh, I'll say one more time. Folks, if you got questions, thoughts, drop them in the chat box. I'm headed there now to see what you're thinking about. And uh, the first one up that I see on the list uh, comes from Glenn. How is climate change going to affect agriculture in North Carolina in 2050? Great question, Glenn. And uh, obviously a lot of great minds thinking about that. Uh, what is climate change, uh, you know, uh, going to affect crop production and definitely is. Uh, Sometimes uh, warmer temperatures are great for you know, more production on crops. Sometimes warmer temperatures are detrimental. Sometimes uh, crops uh, survive a little bit better on less water than more water. So we've got faculty members looking at all these variations in terms of how is our climate changing? Are we getting warmer? Are our seasons getting longer? You know, there's some crops that take you know, a certain number of days to mature. Uh, and maybe if we had an extra two or three days because the climate's changed, we can grow additional crops. On the counter side, uh, if we grow, you know, if we get too hot or too dry, you know, a lot of our crops could suffer. So we've got faculty members looking at a lot of these different variabilities and trying to uh, produce new hybrids, new varieties that uh, can adapt and be what we call resilient to kind of a changing agriculture system. Yeah, because I've seen a lot of research on climate change in North Carolina and in the Southeast. And 
the the impacts are so far ranging. I mean, North Carolina weather, right? Like day to day, week to week is already impossible to predict, it seems. It's all over the place. And so not the climate weather, not the same thing, of course. But then when you look at these like regional models for climate change, the impacts of climate change make the situation in a place like North Carolina that much more variable in in the short term. So, I mean, it, it's it's nice to know that you've got people thinking about it. Yeah, and just, uh, I won't take a lot of time, but uh, we've identified three focus areas for our initiative to at least focus on. And one of those is on resilient ag systems. That is what this person wakes up every day thinking about putting teams together to make sure we're resilient to the changes of climate. And so I'm excited about his leadership and the things that his teams will do in this building. All right. Chuck is asking, are there plans to do some GMO research? Uh, our faculty members are heavily involved, have been with GMO, uh, all the, uh, the new tools around GMO, uh, gene editing, CRISPR technology, two Nobel Prize awarded yesterday or yeah. Tuesday on CRISPR. And we have a world leading expert uh, in our college, uh, Dr. Rodolph Berengu uh, is a CRISPR expert. Uh, and so we have a lot of uh, what I'll call, uh, and we have a lot of uh, uh, plant scientists working in the generic genetics area in all aspects of plant breeding and plant production. So I would say GMOs, non-GMOs, traditional row crops, uh, we, we've got it all uh, and, and have had, that's one of them, NC State's core, our, uh, our plant breeders uh, are probably uh, either first or second in terms of our, our uh, NC State producing more plant breeders for the industry than anybody else. All right. Uh, Cindy Lincoln has a question. Will there be an effort within the Plant Science Initiative and other partners to develop and promote plant-based meat alternatives? Great question, Cynthia. Welcome. Thank you for the invite. Um, uh, I would say Yes, uh, with a caveat is, again, this is one of those great partnerships that we will partner with some of our food scientists. We have essentially a department in our college that focuses on food science, but I, I will also point you to the, uh, to the uh, Kannapolis Research uh, uh, um, Network in Kannapolis. We have a food innovation lab uh, that's up and going. And Dr. Bill Mutis is the director of the FIL, Food Innovation Lab, and has got, uh, is, is getting up and running. Uh, we had a groundbreaking there probably a year or so ago. Bill has been on uh, staff about a year and a half, but his big focus is on plant-based foods. And he has all the equipment to, uh, to, to help uh, scientists figure out which ones taste the best, which ones uh, don't taste the best, which ones are high protein, low total protein. But Bill and his team will be working with some of our faculty members to say, okay, this one's the best chickpea, for instance, that we can grow. Now, how do we grow it? So they'll be working in conjunction with some of our faculty that know how to grow chickpeas. So yes, I'd say NC State uh, is, uh, has got some great minds looking at uh, non-animal proteins. All right, uh, Vanessa's gonna get the last question tonight. What are you most looking forward to? I'm looking forward to, uh, I think the, the student piece of this uh, is, excites me. There's a lot of great stuff that will come out uh, from agriculture, but to, to train people that fit in our community and can tell the agricultural story from a young person's perspective. And these are the people that are going to sit in my shoes someday and help drive decisions in agriculture. I'm excited for that next generation of student coming out that will change the world, not only with their smarts from science, but also their ability to communicate our results. Great question. Never, never had that one before. That is a really good question. And that's a great last question too. And on that really top positive note. Thanks, Vanessa. Great, great stuff. Well, Steve, I'm gonna call time on it because we're over time now. So uh, thanks for being with us at the Virtual Science Cafe and sharing. You're welcome. My pleasure. Uh, glad to do it. And hopefully uh, somebody gets something out of this, uh, whether it's small or large, I appreciate the opportunity. 
Well, it looks like we had, uh, looking at the chat, there were a whole lot of shout outs to what I think is an AP environmental science class. So glad that, uh, glad that a bunch of students tuned in. Now they all know to go look at the ag sciences. That's right, we got careers for you, come to NC State. There, <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah, great talk, great presentation. Everybody, I'll remind you that of course we'll be back here next Thursday night, seven o'clock. Next week, we're gonna be talking with award-winning and acclaimed science and nature writer, Ted Williams. He's gonna be talking about his book, Earth Almanac. Don't miss it. It's going to be a great conversation. Book night here at the Virtual Science Cafe next Thursday at 7 o'clock. Hope that we'll see you there. Uh, make sure that you're following the museum on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. All three, at Natural Sciences is our handle. So give us a follow because you'll see all kinds of great sciencey stuff happening there all the time. Subscribe to us here on YouTube, and then you'll get that reminder, that notification to join us next Thursday night as well, or for any of the other virtual programs that we're doing live stream here throughout the week. We do lots of cool stuff. Naturalsciences.org is the museum's website. There you can get information about the full calendar of events and virtual stuff that we have going on. And you can see and read all about our new policies. The museum is open. So you can come and actually visit us in our downtown Raleigh, Prairie Ridge and Whiteville location. So I hope that you'll come and see us. The website will give you all the information you need to get your free timed ticket entry. I think that is everything on my list that I needed to say. Steve, thank you once again. Everybody, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Take care and stay safe. Bye, everybody.